Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see all of you. Thank you for coming. I'm Neela Stroganoff, Program Director for the Friends of San Pedro Valley Park. And as well, I organize field trips and classes. My program in here runs from about October to June, and it will be a hybrid year. So some will be at Zoom and some in person. Um, in December, we will welcome Louis Stringer, who is the Associate Director of the Natural Resources at the Presidio Trist, Trust. He will be with us on Saturday, December the 10th, at 3 p.m. at the Visitor Center, in person. The title of this program is Daylight in Springs, Creeks, and Marshes, 20 Years of Wetland Restoration in the Presidio of San Francisco. He will discuss the decades-long effort to restore the Tennessee Hollow watershed and mountain lake. So it should be a fascinating botany uh, talk. Um, in January, we will have both the mushroom bioblitz towards the end of the month with J.R. Blair, and it will be uh, just the, the day before the mushroom fair showed me we need mushrooms. We need lots of mushrooms, so please all sign up. We'll have 30, about 30, 30 slots for people to sign up and come. And once we have the event right, we'll send out the email and so on and so forth. Um, let's see, just lost my spot. And uh, so, and we're also going to have photography classes starting in January, and hopefully maybe in February as well. Uh, our January speaker will come to us via Zoom from the East Coast. And I'll let you know that it's about leatherback turtles, and I've got a weakness I don't know much about them. And I saw the characters of, of the Academy, and since then I can't rest in peace. So I need to know more about these leatherbacks. So all this, uh, as I say, all these details about photography classes, about um, the bio blitz and so on and so forth, the mushroom bio blitz, will be available in the newsletter and will be also available through emails that Adrian sends out. Adrian, my husband, over here, membership director, very important person. Mm -hmm. Kevin Bailey, I must say, a very important man. He's our video recording specialist and he's going to video record today's lecture. So thank you very much, Kevin. We're very pleased with you. And Dr. Tom Parker's lecture, which was last month, is actually now up on the web. So if you missed it and you're interested in the ecosystem that Manzanitas have, and the whole, the whole, by uh, the whole ecosystem, both above and below ground, he did a fantastic job with it, and he made it quite simple and clear. So I think if you re watch that video, you'll be much happier for having seen it. A little of gain to love. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our eminent speaker. Dr. Shannon Bennett is with us today. Dr. Shannon Bennett joined the California Academy of Sciences in 2011 as the institution's first ever associate curator of microbiology, where she broadened the Academy's research scope to include a dedicated focus on viruses and bacteria. Her specialty lies in infectious diseases that can be transmitted from animals to humans. As the Chief of Science and Harry W. and Diana B. Hine, Dean of Science and Research Collections, Dr. Shannon Ben is responsible for the Academy's programs of scientific research and exploration, as well as overseeing the Academy's priceless collection of nearly 46 million specimens from around the world. In this role, she helps to shape bold new research initiatives and oversees a world-class team of uh, explorers and scientific leaders who are working to explore, explain, and sustain life on Earth. And Sharon also holds an appointment as one of the institution's Patterson Scholars in Science and Sustainability. She received a Bachelor of Science from McGill University and her doctorate degree in zoology from the University of British Columbia, very much a Canadian as I am, and I'm very pleased to know that. <laughs> so please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Shannon Bennett. Thank you, Mila. That uh, was quite a 
wonderful introduction. I'm happy to know I'm amongst fellow Canadians as well as my um, other uh, neighbors uh, and Americans and my husband's an American and my daughter's a dual. So we're an integrated family. So uh, thank you all for coming here on a Saturday afternoon. I want to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, uh, emerging infectious diseases. Uh, none of us are immune to becoming a host of a pathogen. Some of those uh, instances we know about, uh, often we know when we get an infection, but actually it might surprise you to know that most of the time we don't even know when we're being, being infected by a pathogen. Many uh, infectious events are asymptomatic, and one of the things I'm really interested in uh, doing research on is understanding where those kinds of infections come from and what is the tipping point that turns something into something that we might not feel very perturbed uh, about, might not really threaten our health as an individual or as a population to when it becomes a threat. And underlying all of those transitions is really evolution. And that's what the Academy is all about. We look at the evolution of life on Earth and my role is to look at the evolution of viruses. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about COVID-19, also monkeypox, and then about infectious diseases in general that I study and how they're emerging, what's driving infectious diseases. Okay, so before I start uh, talking about the meat of the content that I wanna share with you, I wanna give you a little bit of my own personal history. So this is me when I was 19. I was a biology and theater major, so, which really indicates that I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and that's totally fine. So as I was trying to find myself and my passion in the world, I, uh, I landed a volunteer opportunity to spend the summer in Liberia, West Africa. So this was back in 1989. I traveled to West Africa. This is me in Monrovia waiting for my transportation up country. This is the upcountry field site. There's me in the back just coming from a little hike to a waterfall. And we're really close to the Guinea border. So I arrived in June, coming from the travel health clinic in Canada with all my vaccines and my anti-malarial meds. I was all set. And then uh, within a few weeks, I got malaria. So these are not my red blood cells, but human red blood cells with the trophozoite phase of the malaria parasite, which is a parasite called Plasmodium. And I have the species called Plasmodium falciparum, which is one of the most dangerous forms of malaria. And uh, I asked, uh, why aren't my med medicines being effective as a preventative? And everybody said, oh, this parasite has evolved resistance to those anti-malarials. It's been resistant for at least eight weeks now. <laughs> so I was like, oh boy, do I feel out of date. Um, only to say, the pace of evolution, especially when you're a microorganism, can be very rapid. Humans evolve very slowly, uh, parasites evolve very quickly, and the smaller the parasite, the more populous it is, the more numerous it is in your body, the quicker it can leap through um, evolutionary change and make big changes, as we know, uh, through COVID. So I was trying to recover from a Plasmodium falciparum infection, and uh, at one point I was going potty, and I noticed that my stool, that's another word for poop, uh, looked like it was full of coffee grounds. And that is a hallmark, and if you ever travel and you feel sick to your stomach, when your stool looks like it's full of coffee grounds, it means you're bleeding into your intestine. And lo and behold, I had another parasite called amoebic dysentery. And this is, this is a little parasite. Um, its genus name is Entamoeba, species name Histolytica. Histo means histolysis, so it can basically erode the lining of your intestine and you, you start to hemorrhage into your uh, colon. Uh, which is a large intestine, which is what was happening to me. So uh, I got on a motorbike, someone else was driving, and we drove about five miles to a little tiny health clinic. And on the way there, we had a little spill, I got a cut in my leg, and I developed a staph infection. So this is Staphylococcus aureus. 
And it's actually in 50% of everybody here in this room, it might live on your skin. And it's an opportunist so that when your immune system is down and when there's a break in your skin where it can sort of colonize, it can turn into an infection. And these can be very dangerous and turn into septicemia, which is basically another word for blood poisoning. So three extremely different parasites. Plasmodium falciparum is a human specialist transmitted by the bite of a mosquito. Antamoeba histolytica is actually um, brought to you by drinking or eating contaminated food that's, uh, that's contaminated by fecal material, poop. Uh, and it's a generalist. It can affect a wide range of things. And then Staph aureus, a commensal, almost, a neutral party that lives on most of our skin that can take advantage of a weakened immune system. That's a bacterium, and these two are eukaryotic parasites. So at this point, I was feeling really sick, and they hospitalized me in a leper colony. I kid you not. Leprosy is caused by another kind of bacterium, a genus called Mycobacterium. I did not get leprosy. But leprosy is a different pathogen altogether, again, unlike these. Um, mycobacteria need long exposure times, and there's usually a genetic predisposition amongst the hosts to host leprosy. So uh, as I was laying in bed in this leper colony and, and uh, being cared for by many people that were victims of leprosy, I thought a lot about parasitism. And I thought about how it evolved, how it got to me, where it came from, and how it had overcome all of my own personal defenses, including state-of-the-art Canadian prescribed health clinic, travel clinic medicines. And it fascinated me. So I, at that moment, decided that I wanted to come back to, the, to uh, Canada and study uh, pathogens and parasitism. And uh, so that was like a turning, turning point for me. Uh, what really sealed the deal was while I was in the leper colony, and as I mentioned, this is in 1989, Liberia experienced its major uh, civil war uh, in 1991. So while I was in this leper colony up at the border near Guinea, the first attempted coup uh, that was the um, foreshocks of that civil war happened. And I heard machine gun fire, a whole army flowed from Guinea into Liberia, right in the town where I was uh, housed. And everybody said if I hadn't been in the leper colony, I would surely have been kidnapped, killed, or worse. Uh, what's worse than being killed? Okay, kidnapped or killed. So, um, so you could argue that parasites saved my life <laughs> and that I am here to tell the tale. So, um, so that was really what fascinated me as I was there, and I did safely get evacuated. It took about two or three weeks after the fighting had calmed down before I, I managed to get back to Monrovia and then get flown back to Canada. Um, and I recovered, as you see. So I'm fine. But I didn't recover from a passion to wa want to understand where pathogens come from, not just in the proximate sense. I know that I had somehow ingested fecal contaminated material. I know that a mosquito had bitten me. But I really wanted to know the big picture of where pathogens come from in general and how they evolve to be successful and capture new hosts like, like humans. So it turns out that most of the pathogens you may have heard about do come from either in recent times or back many thousands, many, many thousands of years. They come from other animals, non-human animals. So HIV, um, which is the a virus that causes AIDS, so it's hum human immunodeficiency virus, comes from non-human primates. It actually evolved in non-human primates and, and jumped into humans, uh, starting with uh, some of the early uh, pandemics that we might be familiar with here in the Bay Area in the 80s. Influenza virus, who here has gotten their flu shot? Yes. So influenza is actually a bird virus, and it's a really flexible virus. It can actually jump into pigs and humans. 
And part of the source or origin of new flu viruses is when a bird virus and sometimes a human virus get into pigs and uh, recombine or reassort their genetic material. So I don't know if any of you remember the H1N1 swine flu pandemic in uh, the, I'm blanking on the year. I think it was 2009. Um, that was, a bird, uh, again, mostly bird in origin. Hantavirus, anybody remember the Four Corners epidemic in, in the 80s? I think it was 86. Hantavirus resides in small mammals, and it jumps into humans, but it doesn't actually, hasn't figured out how to move beyond humans efficiently to affect other humans. Zika virus, who remembers Zika virus of the 2016 uh, global tropical epidemic? Uh, it actually, when we do the genetic tree of all the viruses that include Zika and its relatives, it turns out that the original host was mosquitoes. And then we have lots of bat viruses that we're uh, watching and are very aware of. Nipah and Hendra, you might not have heard of, but Ebola, there's an outbreak right now in Uganda. Uh, there's been serious, the last serious outbreak that actually made it to the US was in 2013. Uh, Marburg is a close relative. And then the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, the causative agent of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, is actually a bat virus. And now we have monkeypox. And actually, I put a question mark here because we're not really sure what is the reservoir host or the animal host for monkeypox, but it didn't evolve in humans. And it's not a monkey virus per se, uh, although monkeys were the first host that it was detected in in the 1950s. And the strongest hypothesis is that it's a rodent uh, virus. So many of these viruses have these natural reservoirs, and I'm really interested in trying to understand when humans intersect with those reservoirs and drive and, and pick up these pathogens, and then how, does these, how do any of these pathogens gain the potential to cause epidemics or even pandemics? And we call viruses that come from other non-human am animals zoonoses. So uh, that brings me to COVID-19. There's been a lot of research done to try to understand where COVID-19 came from. Now, that's sort of where it came from in, in the more proximate sense, the, the, the early days of this pandemic. So it was first observed in a seafood market in the province of um, Wuhan, China. And the first cases were actually picked up not in 2020, but in 2019, late in the year. And that's where the name comes from. COVID-19 doesn't refer to the 19 pounds we all put on because we were shut and locked down in a pandemic. 19 refers to the year of discovery, 2019. Um, when investigators mapped the cases, it was clear that they were concentrated around the seafood market and then over time slowly spread. And for many people that have heard uh, uh, the theory out there that it was, this was a lab escapee, the lab is quite a bit distant and south, and there was no concentration of cases around the lab. There is actually no evidence that this was a lab leak. That's a complete conspiracy theory and rumor. In fact, when investigators went and sampled the Wuhan seafood market and sampled these hosts and these cages, there was evidence on the surfaces of COVID-19 antigen, that is the leftover bits of virus that the virus leaves behind on surfaces. So it most definitely originated in the seafood market and it probably originated through wildlife trade or peri-domesticated farming of different kinds of animals. And one of the primary animals that carries COVID-19 in nature or not in nature, but in sort of these sort of peri-urban, peri-peripherally, uh, peripheral agricultural environments is the raccoon dog. So uh, a lot of what we know about SARS-CoV-2, uh, the causative agent of COVID, comes from sequencing the virus. So when we get the genetic sequence of a virus, we can put it in a family tree 
just like you would do your own family tree. But you would make your own family tree based on maybe verbal, oral history, written journal records, knowing who was married to whom. We can't do that with, with, with pathogens. We have to use the genetic sequence to build that family tree. And when we take the sequence of the viruses that were collected, and there are two here that were collected in Hong Kong in 2020 from symptomatic patients, and we put this in a family tree of other viruses that we've already known about, uh, we can see that it clusters with a group of, a big group of viruses that includes SARS-1. Does anybody remember SARS, the first SARS? Uh, it shut down uh, airports all over the world for about 48 hours. It was more pathogenic than SARS-2, um, and it was highly infectious. And it was first observed in Hong Kong. So uh, that was our first clue that this was a SARS-related virus because it was clustered in the same family cluster as SARS-1. In this same family, there are many bat samples. And in fact, some of these bat samples happened in 2006. SARS-1 was formally described in 2003. But many of these samples come from 2013, 16, 18, 06. And that, was, that reflects that many people wanted to try to understand the origin of SARS-1. So it was a big effort to sample uh, the community of SARS viruses from animals that might be out there to try to understand where SARS-1 came from. And that's what caused this whole branch to get populated with relatives of SARS-1 and SARS-2. And it turns out that some of those samples are actually very closely related to SARS-2, and they both were taken from bats. Um, a lot of other, there's a bunch of other relatives I want to point out in this family tree. Um, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Virus. Does anybody remember MERS? Um, uh, uh, intermediate host to MERS is the camel. And so a lot of people were being exposed to MERS by, um, uh, through their camels. Uh, don't let a camel lick your face. <laughs> Another thing to note is human coronavirus. So it turns out that actually we've hosted human coronaviruses probably for hundreds of years. Um, there's at least four strains. This is just one of them. They probably spilled over into humans um, up to four independent times over the last hundred years or so. And 30% of all common colds are caused by human coronaviruses. And you can see by the fact that there are many samples branching off before you get to human coronavirus, that the human coronaviruses are a pretty distant relative of SARS-CoV-2. But what they all have in common is in unequivocally bats. So these are viruses. This is a virus family, in fact, that uh, originates in bats. So this is the hypothesis, and it's very well supported by data that dissects where SARS coronavirus 2, SARS CoV 2, came from based on uh, the mix of genetic sequence data as well as that epidemiologic data plotting the um, cases through time in space and showing their concentration around the market. So, first, we have bats. Bats that are living in caves, probably distributed. There's a few caves that were sampled when, after SARS-1 was made uh, known to us. Many bats were sampled. Many of them have corona-like viruses. Then there's, a, there's a many um, little industry farms that are on the periphery of um, the intersection between wild spaces and human spaces. And so there's probably some wild or maybe farmed intermediate host that was the bridge between bats and the rest of us. And actually, when they did some studies on the people that worked in uh, these sort of uh, farms, these wildlife farms of raccoon dogs, etc., they had very high antibody levels. That means their immune system recognized coronavirus-like uh, uh, 
prompt. So they were reacting to coronaviruses through their immune system. So that suggests that there's a lot of exposure at this interface between some unknown intermediate host. Then it turns out there actually was two SARS-CoV lineages that kind of jumped into that first epidemic at the end of 2019-2020. So two lineages spilled over from this intermediate reservoir host and then was transported through either um, probably through these farmed animals into the market and then spread out from there into the market area, the community, so community transmission, and then eventually throughout Wuhan and then finally into um, the, an international scene. In the U.S., we saw the first cases in Washington State, and they were linked directly to Wuhan. So here we are today. This virus is now, uh, has uh, caused almost 640 million cases uh, and over 6 million deaths, six, over 6.6 6 million deaths. Um, this is the dynamic over here that shows you the waves. I don't know if you all remember in the early days of January, February 2020, even March 2020, we all thought, okay, there's a wave, it's going to crash, and we'll be done. And, and actually, in China, that looked like what was happening. They managed to lock down really fiercely and managed to have only a single wave for the longest time. But on a global scale, we had wave after wave. And that's what's shown here. These are the waves of daily new cases going up and down and up and down through time. And this very big peak here is the Omicron variant. And then down here are the deaths. And you can see that slowly over time, even though we have had some very peak viruses showing up, the deaths have gradually gotten less and less. And that's in part through um, vaccination. So it doesn't often happen. I just want to go back to this uh, slide here. This is, in, in studying disease ecology, we actually feel, um, we have evidence to suggest that there are lots of viruses and pathogens out there, and they're almost pinging us. You know, there are many, many undiagnosed fever-like illnesses that happen in many parts of the world that never have an agent identified. And so probably this is happening not that infrequently, where humans are making inroads into natural systems and being exposed. That's where Ebola keeps coming from, that people are going out into the forest, they're probably hunting bushmeat, and they're becoming exposed to Ebola and then bringing it back into towns. And most of the time, Ebola dies out in the village. But in 2013, it actually got to the United States but then it was controlled. So the big question with, corona, with SARS-CoV-2 is what happened when it was jumping into humans? Was it already really good at human-to-human -human transmission, or did it pick that up along the way? And it, it turns out most people, uh, most scientists assume, based on certain changes that already had been observed in the genome when we first got that sequence, that it had the capability of jumping between humans really efficiently at the time that we caught it. So it had already picked up incredible human-to-human -human transmission. And in the early days in Wuhan, China, when they first started seeing these cases of severe respiratory syndrome in the hospitals, and they were all linked to the market, they thought it was multiple instances of animal to human. And probably what it was was community transmission already, efficient human-to-human, -human, very quickly. So I always like to take it to home. This is the dynamic in the US. Again, we have wave upon wave of, um, of cases here, hospitalizations here, including severe hospitalizations. This is the test positivity rate. I don't know if you remember back in the early days, we were all, um, it was indicated by our public health officials that if the test positivity rate dropped, that is the number of people you test, what percentage is positive, that if that dropped low enough, we would be able to go out and be free. Um, it turns out that uh, the days of low test positivity rates are far behind us. 
and there's still many waves, and it's still really high. And actually, it's really high now because many of us are testing at home and aren't even reporting our test rates. So people that are being tested today are most likely those that go to a hospital or um, a healthcare setting, and they're, all, they're pretty in a, in a severe state, and they're getting tested in a clinical setting. So the test positivity rates aren't, aren't as uh, indicative of community transmission, which is pretty low right now, which is nice. Here in the Bay Area, we're also keeping it pretty low. This was the big peak in the summer, Omicron BA5 mostly, BA4 a little bit. Um, we have pretty high vaccination rates here in California, and so the death rates continue to be low on that side. Um, this is Bay Area, and this is California-wide. And if you look here at some of the hot spots where new uh, cases are the highest, uh, Southern, uh, uh, Southern California, close to the Mexican border, is pretty hot. Um, uh, other places where vaccination rates are kind of low, and then places where there's a lot of people, like uh, the Bay Area. I like to call this my oh crap slide because this is something I'm so excited about. Most people are really excited about it, but we've actually put in a nationwide capability to continue to monitor sewage for pathogens. And this capability, uh, which was really grown up, an, inv uh, an invention of necessity due to COVID tracking, has also been used to track polio, for example, and other pathogens. So this, uh, this is a, a map of California, and there are many um, sewage surveillance systems in place across California, and then this extends nationwide. And here in California, I just honed in on, on Oceanside, and you can see this is the summer peak of viruses, and this is the abundance of viruses in our sewage. So it's decoupled from clinical, from data uh, about the number of individuals that might show up. And so it's actually very, a very unbiased view of the dynamic of this virus in populations, in human populations. So in this case, um, in spite of the test positivity rate being high and that kind of a bias where most people aren't reporting to their test results, we still see that the viruses are low. So we have low abundance of viruses. So whenever I hear uh, about viruses, COVID cases spiking up in Europe, you know, the U.S. kind of follows behind Europe. We're, we're a, bit, um, a bit behind, but we always almost go the same way. I love to check my local sewage uh, record. Yeah, I don't check the sewage, but I check the, da the data on the sewage. <laughs> and it really gives you a great readout of what the virus abundance is like in your community. Um, all right, so this is another family tree. I know it's a little bit daunting, um, but this is basically the family tree of Omicron after, it, I mean, sorry, of SARS-CoV-2 after it jumped into humans. So it's uh, got, a, on the bottom, it's got time. So back here in 2020, all these sort of gray ones are the original strains including 19A and 19B, the 2019 two lineages I mentioned that emerged first in, in Wuhan. And then it's now kept evolving. So many of you might have memories of Delta, of the Delta strain. That was back in the summer of 2021. And then Omicron, which first showed up in the fall of 2021. And you may recall that emerged in, and it was first detected in South Africa. It turns out that it probably evolved somewhere in, in Central Africa, and there's some evidence that Omicron might have evolved in a rodent reservoir and then spilled back into humans, because it picked up a lot of facility uh, to uh, avoid certain, uh, or, or uh, uh, basically infect certain kinds of um, mouse cells. So Omicron hit the stage in the fall of 2021, and then really became a global issue in early in 2022. And that was a huge, all those slides I showed you with that huge peak, that was all Omicron. So the highest peak of daily new cases and deaths 
uh, than any other prior strain of the, of the virus, SARS-CoV-2. And since then, Omicron has continued to evolve, and many, many different strains have popped up. So some of the ones, the original Omicron strain was called BA1, but the peak that was caused this summer was, uh, was a mix of BA4, slowly transitioning to BA5. All of these amber colors are all BA5. And the viruses that are now becoming, uh, are being watched are BQ, BQ1, BQ1.1, and XBB. XBB is actually a recombinant virus. So it's got a few uh, signatures of other kinds of Omicron mixed in with a BA5 backbone. So this shows you, uh, this is a report of the variants in the United States. And you can see that BA5 was dominant starting in August. A little bit of BA4 sort of dying out. Um, some other strains of BA4 coming up but staying low, but BA5 is slowly starting to go down. And uh, by today's date, and this is a now cast, so they're sort of modeling rates of change. It's not actual data, uh, these last three bars. But it suggests that BA5 will slowly lose its position of dominance to BQ1 and BQ1.1. Um, some people might I love to geek out over the turnover of the different variants. And that's because the change in which variant is dominant uh, reflects a change in their evolution. That, that family tree shows that they're evolving, they're accruing changes um, over time. And the big question is, how do those changes impact us? How, how do those changes make that virus or that strain more fit? from the virus point of view, and more dangerous from the human population point of view. And that danger could, could be in the way that it escapes uh, prior immunity through vaccination or natural infection. It might be how fast it copies itself in our body uh, and boosts up the levels of virus so that a person might get sicker. It might change how efficient it is to infect different kinds of cells in our body that could make us more sick or less sick. So uh, whenever uh, lung tissue is infected efficiently, you can develop pneumonia and die, whereas upper respiratory infections are more mild. Uh, and the common cold is a good example of that kind of tissue tropism leading to more mild disease. So it's always interesting when you see this kind of a turnover to ask, why are certain viruses that used to be so successful getting replaced by new strains? What are the evolutionary changes that have occurred in the virus and how will it impact uh, human health? So it turns out that there have been tons of changes and most of those changes are in the spike protein. And some of those changes have meaning that we can measure in a lab setting and others don't. Or at least we can't measure the meaning. We don't know. So this is the um, SARS-CoV spike protein, uh, the, the, the protein that um, uh, sits on the outer surface of the virus particle and is the major protein that binds to the host cell receptor and allows the virus to enter the host cell. It's actually the major target of our, our immune response. Our antibodies bind to it. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of meaning to changes that happen in the spike protein that can affect anything from how well it binds to the host cell, how efficiently it fuses with our membrane and enters the host cell, and how it might escape an antibody response. So all of the changes that have been mapped in orange have meaning that's been measured in a laboratory setting. So these are mutations with documented phenotypic effects. Anything that's kind of in this blue color are um, kind of even more significant than a mutation. They're insertion deletion, so a chunk of the genome has become lost or been gained. And those also have serious meaning, impacts, or phenotypic effects. 
And then anything in green are a bunch of changes, and we don't know what meaning that they have, but they're clustered within the middle part of the trimer of the spike protein. So maybe they have meaning in how the protein folds or how it might, after fusion, enter into the host cell as it unfolds. So pulling all together, the changes that have been observed as these variants evolve and emerge, they have different phenotypes or behaviors uh, or properties that are being conferred by these changes. Some of these properties affect the transmissibility or how contagious the virus is. Some of them affect once uh, it, you get infected, how sick you get maybe how efficient the virus binds and copies itself in your cells, and how many progeny virus are generated. And then some of them directly impact immune escape. Some of them are actually conferring to the virus the ability to avoid a prior immune response, whether it's by vaccination or prior infection. The take home message though, is that regardless of which or what combination of properties change in these viruses, they've all conferred uh, variant after variant an increasing potential for greater growth, either within the cell, within the host, or across populations. So the take home message is that these variants at this time are just getting better and better at doing what they do. And I've just put some examples here, greater transmissibility, um, more infectious to lower lung tissue, which would impact pathogenicity, and then the, the antibodies that become less and less effective at blocking, for example, Omicron infection. A lot of people out there, because the human coronavirus, which causes the common cold, a lot of evolutionary biologists are entertaining the idea that Maybe over time, SARS coronavirus 2 will become more like the common cold. And uh, we won't really uh, ever maybe develop a fully protective immunity, but we'll be living with sort of mo more mild cold symptoms year over year. That may well be true, but that's not happening yet. The variants are, are getting better and better, not milder and milder. Better and better at infecting humans and spreading across the human population. So maybe in 100 years, we can check back, <laughs> but not yet. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the vaccine strategy, because I just told you that these viruses can potentially evolve uh, to escape prior immunity. <clears throat> so uh, the, the vaccines that we have available, uh, the, the ones that are most successful are the two mRNA vaccines. And those are basically taking fragments of the virus. These are RNA viruses. And they're placing a section of the virus that codes for proteins into, um, uh, into a, a droplet that then can be spread into our cells. And our cells make the proteins, make the virus proteins, and generate antibodies against those proteins. So they're not alive, they're not living viruses, and they're not even complete viruses. They're just for that little piece of spike. And our own cells are producing the proteins in our own uh, machinery system. So they're very effective and super safe. Uh, we had, uh, it was a game changer when these vaccines were available. It created a massive reduction in the rate of hospitalization and death due to COVID. Um, and uh, they have continued to, to um, be watched. So, you know, one of the problems is that we've, we've noticed that you need to get a boost to keep your, um, your vaccination status at its peak optimum. So I've gotten my bivalent booster. Um, this is a booster that was tweaked. It included the original Wuhan strains, and it also includes uh, BA4 and BA5. So uh, it's, it's even better than the prior boosters that we got. And both Pfizer and Moderna have them. For Pfizer, the boost, the bivalent boost is available for 12 and up, and Moderna 18 and up. 
There's some uh, other kinds of, mono of monoclonal antibodies that can be taken as kind of a vaccination, but uh, with the new Omicron, especially the BQ1, this is becoming less and less effective. So consider a line through this for people that can't get vaccinated. But what I really wanted to talk about was what, what is a vaccine anyway? And um, I heard this great analogy. I listened to TWIV this week in virology. It's a really great podcast if you're interested in viruses. But um, a guest on that show likened vaccination to a fire extinguisher. Your immune system is your fire extinguisher. And when a spark lands, which is like a pathogen landing on uh, your mucous membranes in your nose or uh, getting on your hands because you touched a surface and rubbing your eyes, when that pathogen lands, your immune system acts like a fire extinguisher dousing a spark. And sometimes if that fire extinguisher is freshly charged, the pressure is high, and if you point it right at the spark, you can put out that fire before it blooms. But what a vaccine doesn't do is prevent a spark from landing. So, so uh, I, I think a lot of the public um, the public opinion about the effectiveness of vaccination was, uh, it, there was discouragement that uh, vaccines weren't blocking infection. But vaccines are not designed to block infection any more than a fire extinguisher is designed to block a spark from landing. To block a spark from landing, you wear a mask or you isolate, uh, but you or you, know, you, or you wear gloves and, and personal protective equipment. But vaccines are not designed to stop a spark from landing any more than a fire extinguisher is. And I mentioned that the effectiveness of the vaccine is, again, like the fire extinguisher analogy, a little bit a combination of how well charged your fire extinguisher is and where you're pointing that fire extinguisher. So to take that analogy, um, to your, your, your immune system that's been charged by vaccination, if you've had your vaccine or your boost six months ago, your fire extinguisher isn't as charged up as if you just received your booster. And so uh, you, you lose some of that power, right? And we know that after about six months, the antibodies wane. Although the other arm of your immune system, the T cell immunity, is, is, it remains strong. So if your immune system or your, you know, your vaccine is charged up, your immune response, and it's at its peak optimum, then viruses that are evolving this capability of immune escape, uh, you can still get them, right? So this, think of the cloud of the, immune ex the fire extinguisher going out, and you might have antibody mismatch, and slowly uh, the the BQ1 or the BA5 is not uh, quite squarely in the, in the um, target zone of how your, your uh, immune system might be trained. But if you're fresh, if your immune system is strong and your booster status is fresh, you can still get it really well. If your immune system is starting to wane and your fire extinguisher is losing its power, its pressure, so long as you're aiming it right, so long as antibody mismatch or immune escape hasn't occurred, you could still uh, effectively neutralize the spark or the virus. But what we're seeing uh, now with people that are six months out and with the emergence of the BQ1 uh, and 1.1 is that not only is the power of your fire extinguisher waning, but the mismatch is also occurring, and so you'll get this sort of slightly reduced effectiveness. So um, it's still effective, but that is basically why most people are suggesting to re get a boost after about six months and to get the boost that is tailored to the changing strain so that you basically get back to a reset to this position. So two things, freshening up your immune system and targeting your immune response to the bivalent booster. Gets you back into that zone. 
So um, there's still a lot that you can do um, in addition to vaccination. And it really depends, you know, as a society, we've kind of moved away from these top-down sort of public health mandates, like you must wear a mask, you must stay home. Uh, remember in the old days, we weren't even allowed to drive across county lines or go to parks. They closed parks and all these outdoor things. So I, I am happy that we've now returned to a life where we're empowered to make our own decisions, right? Um, and those decisions can be any of these things, and you can take these steps based on your own risk status. So many of us can assess our risk status and then make uh, adjustments to our behavior. So for example, one-way masking does work. If you're someone who's vulnerable, who has some of the health risks for severe COVID, you can wear a mask and you can mix with people that aren't and you will be protected. 100% protected depends on the mask, but certainly one-way masking works. Um, well-ventilated conditions and how long you're in conditions are both very important things. So for example, if you are in a well-ventilated area, even an outdoor area, it's really a safe environment in general. And then um, good hand washing, even though data is coming out that COVID is not significantly transmitted by fomites. So fomites are things are droplet contaminated surfaces. You might touch a desk or a doorknob or um, a telephone um, and you could pick up a fomite, you rub your eyes or scratch your nose. It turns out humans touch their faces about 90 times in an hour, which is <laughs> shocking, right? Um, and I think some people touch their faces even more when wearing masks just because it's adjusting. So I'm always watching myself. But, um, it turns out that even though COVID-19 is mostly a respiratory disease, flu is definitely a big, uh, there's a big transmission risk for fomites. Monkeypox is transmitted by fomites. Colds in general are transmitted by fomites. And so it's just really good to wash your hands and not touch your face. Um, and I can't say too much about staying up to date on your vaccines. Um, and for some of us that are older, like I myself, um, I'm, you know, I struggle with high blood pressure and I'm 54 and I haven't got my shingle shot yet. So I have had a conversation with my healthcare provider and I am eligible for Paxlovid, which is a major antiviral medication that could really turn me around if I got sick with COVID very quickly. So you should always make sure you talk to your healthcare provider and you have a plan. Um, we have a member of our family who's severely asthmatic. They have a plan for how to regulate if they're exposed to COVID. And I am a big fan of staying home when I feel sick, which is not my culture. You know, when, uh, I don't know if you remember in the old days when you go to work, like everybody's coughing and sneezing and, and embarrassed to stay home when they feel sick. It's like, stay home, <laughs> just go home. Now we can all work from home, so there's really no excuse. Um, as a scientist, some of the things that m excite me most about the COVID pandemic, and there are exciting things, like uh, systematic sewage surveillance is an exciting thing. It's really, it's so cool. Um, but the other thing that's really exciting is the transparency of data and information. Uh, when I, uh, three years ago, I would, uh, it would take me six months to get data published in a peer-reviewed journal and ready for the public to consume. Now, people are posting data online. They are publishing it in preprint servers. They, the community can start to analyze. It still has to go through peer review, but people can already start to analyze that. And the Chinese, uh, CDC posted the sequences for the early strains of SARS-CoV-2 right away so that our vaccine companies like Pfizer and Moderna could start to design vaccines. And in an unprecedented uh, trans, you know, transparency of information meets new technologies, we had vaccines in a record time in less than 18 months. That's never happened before.
And so this is a transformative time to be a scientist. And it's a transformative time to be in a society that can take advantage of science and make real meaningful changes to protect human health in real time. So it's really exciting. These are all of the dashboards and publicly uh, accessible ways to look at data in real time. So you yourselves can look at the phylogenetic or family tree of the SARS-CoV strains coming out. You can look at um, the data in, in, in uh, countries all around the world. We couldn't do that. You might think we could have done that before, but three years ago, we couldn't do that. We couldn't know in real time what was happening in Europe or in Africa. We can know that now. And we can know that not only for coronavirus, but we're actually tracking monkeypox and polio and Ebola in real time. And we can track that all together. So that's really, it's really transformative and exciting. So speaking of monkeypox, I just wanted to talk a tiny bit about monkeypox. It might feel a bit like old news to you all because the cases truly, this is the, the case uh, rates are going down. And now I think today or Thursday, there were only 30 new cases in the US. So that's great, right? Um, and compared to coronavirus, which has caused over 600 million cases worldwide, uh, monkeypox is only causing about 80,000 cases worldwide. But what's really mostly significant, significant about monkeypox is that evolutionary change I talked about. So we saw evolutionary change in spades in coronavirus. We're seeing it in monkeypox too, evolutionary change. And so uh, the evolutionary change is kind of, if you look at this map, uh, the, the spots in blue are countries where uh, since the 1970s, when the first human cases were detected, uh, and, and monkeypox was discovered in 1956 from a lab infected, uh, a lab monkey that was infected. Um, but it, it's been known in humans since 1970, and it's always sort of had a few hundred cases a year in parts of Central and West Africa. But in uh, May, just this past May, this became a global disease. And the reason it did, and all of these red spots worldwide, are cases in countries that never had monkeypox before. And, the, and what happened in May was evolution. So the virus actually evolved. And it became really efficient at human-to-human -human transmission. Before that time, when it was infecting these few countries, it was probably spillovers from some animal that humans interacted with, and it's not really clear what those reservoirs were and are. It's still not clear. Um, so this is the family tree of monkeypox. These are the strains before May in blue and then a few strains in green. But this lineage, which uh, the name is M-pox, because calling it monkeypox is confusing to people. It's not a, a necessarily a monkey disease. We think it's probably a rodent virus. So we call it M-pox. And M-pox clade 2B is now what's evolving in humans and spreading worldwide. So the new name now is HM-pox strain 1. And so we're keeping an eye, everybody's keeping an eye, but this is a whole new world now. This is not a virus that's going to get put back in a bag. Ebola, when it spread to the U.S., it, it still hasn't evolved for, uh, a really, for its pandemic potential, but mon mon monkeypox now has. And the reason we're able to now curb it is there's a vaccine. It's a pretty effective vaccine. It's a smallpox-derived vaccine. And... A lot of the initial wave of monkeypox, of mpox, of human mpox, was because people didn't recognize it. So now we have the tools to recognize it, and it's being diagnosed, and there's diagnostic tools to recognize it, and then people can then isolate. It's actually also not nearly as transmissible as uh, COVID-19. Okay, so I'm going to close out 
by uh, bringing us back to the beginning. Um, I told you about my beginning. There I was, 19 years old, traveling around Africa, exposed to a world of new pathogens for me, except for staph, which I probably brought along with me. Um, it turns out that the world is teeming with viruses. So this is the virosphere. There's probably a tr up to a trillion viruses out there in the world. Some of them infect us, other animals. Some of them, like phage, infect bacteria. Uh, some of them infect other viruses. It's a teeming world of viruses. It's so full of viruses that the question isn't where did that pathogen come from, but why aren't we getting sick all the time? I mean, truly, the opportunities are incredible, and we know so little about them. So that, uh, that really is how I've t turned my thinking around. When I was in Africa and first experiencing pathogens, I wanted to know what happened, where did that thing come from, and why now am I getting sick, or why did this jump into humans now? But the question really is, why doesn't it happen more often? And so at the California Academy of Sciences, where we work a lot on understanding our relationship to, with nature, it provides me with an opportunity to think about all the viruses that are occurring here in sort of natural systems, and what changes in our relationship to natural systems to create a pandemic. And so uh, I started in uh, a, a probably almost 10 years ago working on trying to understand the virosphere or the virome of nature or things in nature and how they related to things that occur in humans or in human adapted environments. And one of the critters I, uh, I have used to help me do this work is the lowly mosquito. So you might think about the mosquitoes. There are 4,000 mosquito species on our planet. Some of them never bite humans, they just bite other animals, and some of them specialize on humans and live in urban environments. And um, I'll tell you some bad news. One of the primary mosquitoes that specialize on humans and it's highly invasive in urban environments called Aedes aegypti, the vector of Zika and dengue, is now well established here in the Bay Area. So it showed up in Alameda, in San Mateo. Uh, it's still not in San Francisco County proper but it's truly probably at least three years now established in the Bay Area writ large. So I'm very interested in describing the virome of mosquitoes because they're sampling different kinds of natural systems. They're sampling animals. They could pick up a coronavirus or a flu virus or a relative of Zika or dengue. And then I could sample that virus, and in many cases, new viruses, and try to understand where that virus came from. And I can do that because the mosquito also has a blood meal that tells me which host it fed upon. And the hypothesis that I'm trying to test is, if you have many, many, many kinds of organisms in an environment, and many, many pathogens, viruses, bacteria spread across these different hosts, what happens to skew the host landscape in a way that favors a pandemic virus, like this, this red bar, which could be something like dengue or Zika? And we're definitely finding that the viromes of mosquitoes skew towards hyperdominance uh, when you get into urban environments and when you degrade the biodiversity of natural environments. So I did some of this work in Thailand, and I'm really interested in taking it to other places. So this is me sampling mosquitoes in the field. We've sampled in Hawaii, in Costa Rica, in Thailand, uh, and we're starting to expand our mosquito sampling to three new countries, uh, Nicaragua, Sri Lanka, and Ecuador. 
And we take these little jewels, think of a mosquito as a flying hypodermic needle, sampling parts of the environment we could never get at. And then we take it into the lab and we can crack it open and understand what it fed upon and what viruses the donor, the blood donor has, and also what viruses mosquitoes themselves have. So when I told you that Zika was a mosquito virus, the reason that we could deduce that was because we found novel viruses that are mosquito-only viruses that were more closely related to Zika and dengue than viruses that are uh, only transmitted from monkey to monkey. So this is our new study. It's funded by the National Institutes of Health. And we're taking our studies to Nicaragua, Ecuador, and Sri Lanka. And we're not only studying mosquitoes, but also other hosts in the environment. So we're sampling from monkeys, from bats, and from humans. And we're using this new kind of sequencer called the Minion, which is about the size of a chocolate bar. And it can run off a solar panel. So we can actually, remember I told you how excited I am to be a scientist where we can share transparently all of our data in real time? Well, this will not only let us share that data, but it will let people that live in those countries collect the data themselves and share it. So that it's not my, I don't own that data, they own that data. And then they can share it and study it and, and, and we can work together to surveil the natural environment and try to better understand how uh, healthy nature uh, can help keep humans healthy by balancing out that pathogen opportunity. So with that, uh, I will take any questions. Wait, wait. Well, absolutely. So, so um, the, 
the, uh, the, the if you have the data out there, right, uh, you, and you are fully transparent, so anybody can go and investigate the sequences of the viruses. And if you know what you're looking for, you'll see that there are thousands of changes in the spike protein alone. And it's easy to just see that it would be almost impossible to engineer that virus. So it really depends on the source. Um, a lot of the scientific uh, papers that are put out on preprint servers, there's this big caveat that says, you know, this hasn't been peer reviewed yet, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, so you always have to check your sources. And for sure, I would say, and most people would agree, that, um, that on the heels of transparency came an info epidemic, right? There was, there was you know, many, many, uh, a, a flood of information and, and a, so much information that sometimes it's hard to check the sources. So uh, I think that it, we have to get back to a point where people are not just taking information at face value, but are thinking critically about the source of that information, um, who's saying what, and going to trusted sources, right, like peer-reviewed journals or um, other kinds of, of robust investigative reporting, for example, or go to the data directly, which you, anybody can do. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. Okay. Um, COVID-19, was that actually found in cats and dogs? Here, because I know in China they were killing them. You know, they were getting rid of them. I, uh, So I think there was, at one point in Hong Kong, there was, Call of hamsters, but um, there have been some evidence, yes, of transmission between a human and a dog or a cat, and uh, it, you know, there's, it, but it's not a, it's not a huge, uh, like, huge culling type of event. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned. I just wanted to clarify this. In Wuhan, you mentioned the raccoon dog. Is that the intermediary, intermediary host? It's one from potential. bat or yeah. from bat to the raccoon dog, and I presume that's being raised. Are they raised for the market? Yeah. And uh, yeah, you also mentioned with MERS, the camel is, is that the intermediary animal as well? But it, was that a bat? Yeah, originally a bat. Originally bats. So, okay. the, so the thing about this whole family of viruses, the coronavirus family, is uh, they they use a host cell receptor called the ACE2 receptor that's on a lot of cells in our body, and that's why people talk about you know heart heart tissue is affected, and liver tissue gets affected, and of course lung tissue and um, you know upper respiratory tissue. But also, that receptor is very conserved across different kinds of animal hosts. So it turns out that this whole virus family is actually pretty versatile at infecting a range of mammals. But we know from the sequence data that almost all of them have um, relatives that are in bats and are kind of native or endemic to bats. And so that's, the, that's why we conclude that the whole family probably has its origin in bats. But it can spill over into a range of different mammals. So uh, with MERS, to, uh, camels were directly sampled and were found to have MERS. But for coronavirus, for, sorry, for COVID-19, no smoking gun has been found. It's not like, um, well, actually the viruses have been recovered from many mammals, SARS-CoV-2, but um, the actual mammals that were in the market at the time of the spillover, those mammals were all destroyed when the market was shut down. So the actual mammal that was the actual reservoir host that was at the origin of this pandemic has not been found. Do we know what makes a good host? Like people obviously are, and, and pigs and yeah. birds. Yeah. Um, well, there's a there's a couple of theories 
up there. Um, I don't know if you've heard if you've heard of, about the fusion loop. So it's a it's a set of mutations in the virus spike protein that allows the virus. So once the virus binds, so these this is it's called coronavirus because the spike proteins kind of make this halo around the virus particle. And these spike proteins bristling off the outside in that halo effect, they bind to a cell receptor on the host membrane. When that binding happens, the host cell actually makes a pocket around that binding event and pulls the virus into what's called an endosome. It's kind of like the cell's stomach. And it floods its stomach with acid and changes the pH. And what that would normally do if it was just some sort of not very good virus or other infectious agent is it would kill it. It's like it's, it's their defense, the cell's defense mechanism. What happens with many viruses is that the minute that endosome is flooded with acid is that it changes the configuration of the spike protein bound to the host receptor and creates a tunnel or a pore. So the, that fusion, that happens between those two proteins creates a tunnel and then the virus's genomic material enters the host cell and it begins its replication cycle. So that fusion element um, is a very, uh, it's conserved across many of these viruses and seems to be a really important part of efficient human to human transmission. So very efficient human cell entry um, and, uh, and onward transmission. So, the trick is that not all of the members of that coronavirus family tree have fusion loop as part of their core uh, adaptive toolkit. And then there's lots of other viruses that are really good at humans, like flu, which is a bird virus. And many flus, like the Spanish influenza epidemic, it never evolved the fusion loop mutation. So I think we, if people think it's important, but I guess I would say that it, it's not, um, what do they call it, when it's sufficient and necessary. It's not quite filling that uh, test to, to know whether that's the smoking gun of efficient human to human transmission. Yes? Well, scientists like David Attenborough and others, naturalists, scientists, botanists, biologists, ecologists, they're all saying with the loss of biodiversity that the world is going through, the lack of the, the, the reduction in natural spaces, we are losing this biodiversity where viruses and bacteria tend to multiply and have hope and have their own host. And with that reduction, these bacteria and viruses have to go somewhere. Especially when we almost eliminate a particular species to Nothing. These these hosts, these, these viruses and hosts have to go somewhere, and they find us as the greatest places to go to. And so, is it possible then that in reality we're facing more and more possibility of having perhaps pandemics in the future, and that this transmissibility of of of, of rather deadly diseases is going to be on the increase rather than on the decrease. I mean, for sure there's, as I said, there's tons of potential pathogens out there. And so there's two things that could be happening right now. One is as humans become more and more numerous and as we continue to erode um, forest edges to raise cattle, for example, or to make new places to live, we're going to be pushing right up against new sources of, of potential viruses. Uh, we're also getting really good at detecting things. And so some people say, well, maybe, um, maybe we're just better at detecting new pathogens. But, you know, we know a pandemic when we see it, right? So, so it's, it's probably, I mean, monkeypox coming on the heels of coronavirus suggests that we are entering a new age where pandemics may become more frequent, regardless of our ability to detect them. I think the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, is, is thinking kind of holistically about humans and our relationship with nature. So a, a lot of times those viruses that spill over are not only spilling over because we're um, increasingly eroding natural systems and coming up against them, 
but that the people that are most vulnerable are eroding that interface with nature. So if you think about um, food insecurity in Africa, the, the you know people that are being driven to bush meat hunts are protein starved and are the least capable of detecting pandemics, stopping pandemics, and uh, recovering from pandemics. So we're not only destroying the environment, but we're not taking care of, of people that are the most vulnerable and most likely to be pushed up against those environmental threats and then could become that bridge to bring viruses to the, to the Western world where we have the density to spread them really quickly. So we have, to have two, we have to solve two problems. We have to take care of people and the inequalities of our society today and we have to protect nature. If I may, one more question. With, with regards to the vaccines and, and post um, viral, this, 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 this COVID 19, there are people who have had uh, vaccinations and they have had reactions from the vaccinations long term. They've also had COVID and have had long term recovery or no recovery from COVID. In other words, their symptoms are still there. They are unable to function. So is it, is there anything that can help these people? Is it something in the vaccine that can be adjusted that, that people don't get such poor um, reactions, long-term reactions, either to the vaccination or to the disease itself? that is, is flooring a lot of people that I hear about and hear from, and, and they are totally incapable of functioning anymore. These are scientists, these are people who are teachers and professors, and, and students who went to college and then came down with COVID. They are unable to function. Yeah. So, um, so, so the adverse side effects of the vaccine are actually very low in number, extremely low in number. Uh, and many of them, uh, you might have heard of myocarditis. So that's one of the adverse reactions to the vaccine. All the data is available for anybody to examine. The CDC and the WHO report all vaccine adverse reactions. And uh, the rates of myocarditis due to the vaccine, uh, which can happen extremely rare, is much less than the myocarditis you can get from actually getting COVID. So COVID absolutely can have long-term manifestations. And it's called long COVID. And at the beginning, pre-vaccines, 30% of all COVID infections went on to become long COVID. That's huge. And uh, it seems to be, uh, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an immune disorder, probably, although at the beginning people weren't sure if we didn't have viral sequelae, right? So like, who, who's had shingles? So, so, so shingles is, you, if you had chicken pox as a child, the virus actually sticks around. And it re-emerges when you're stressed out and you can develop shingles 30 years later. Long COVID is not because, as far as we know, that the virus is sticking around. But the echo of the fight that, that your immune system mounted is sticking around. So things like, uh, you've heard about the cytokine storm, which is your sort of your T cell signaling of your immune system arm is going into hyper mode. So what happens is your, your immune system gets almost hyperactive and people develop autoimmune disorders. So there's higher rates of lupus in people and diabetes in people that have had COVID. So these are all immune disorders. So it's very different from shingles in which the virus is, we think, not sticking around. But there's a huge amount not known. Like why do some people get long COVID and others don't? Is it just related to the dose you got? Is it related to your immune status when you got it? Is it related to your genotype? So certain humans might be more susceptible than others. We don't know. People don't know. 
people with long COVID are probably being treated mostly with immune anti-inflammatory type medicines, so like steroids. Unless they develop something like lupus or diabetes, and then there's other kinds of things they get treated with. But the data just came in that Paxlovid, if you can take Paxlovid during your acute phase of the virus, if you're in that risk group, you reduce your long COVID symptoms by 40, anywhere from 30 to 40 percent. So, so, so definitely long COVID is in part related to the vibumia and how quickly it's controlled with antiviral drugs. But this is the thing about a new pandemic is there's more that we don't know than we do know. Yes? I'm curious about the, uh, I guess we call it the incubation time of COVID-19. I've, I've been in situations where I thought that I was probably exposed and then I, was, then, then I was trying to decide, should I be doing my self-tests right away, or wait a day, or a week, or when's the, when's the optimum time that it would be, that it would rear its ugly head if it was going to? Yeah. So, you know, this is a great question, and the answer has changed. So back in the days of beta and alpha strains, or even the original Wuhan strain, you're looking at it like a five-day incubation period on average. Uh -huh. With Omicron, it's a two-day incubation period. So Whoa. the whole thing is really sped up, and that's because the virus is getting really better at doing its thing. So um, nowadays, in, in sort of a, if I think I've been exposed, and you know, an exposure is not, you know, it's defined by the CDC as 15 minutes in close proximity, so within six feet of somebody. And so if you think you've been exposed and they're positive, I would start, I would start testing by like the next day. But um, a lot of people wait until they're symptomatic to start testing. But you know, if you have any vaccination under your belt or prior immunity whatsoever, you, you might not be that symptomatic. So I, I would say to start testing almost right away if you're- Yeah, I've been vaccinated and boosted, so- Yeah. You know, it, yeah, so you might have pretty mild symptoms. So if you think you're exposed, and you know, we I think we get like six or eight free tests a month from the government. So yeah, I encourage people to start testing right away with Omicron. But back in beta days, <laughs> wait. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, good question. You're welcome. So okay, oh, one more question sure. before we let you go. Of course. Thank you. Some people are asymptomatic. I remember I was going in for a blood test. Yeah. And he says, oh, I had COVID. I said, no, he says, but I was asymptomatic. I'm going, and how do you know you had COVID? Well, I think he had a blood test. Yeah. That said that he had COVID. So he, yeah. It's fascinating, right? Um, so, so there's a lot of confusion, too, because at the beginning, uh, people called it asymptomatic, but really what it was was pre-symptomatic. So you might be asymptomatic at the time of testing, but you, what you really were was pre-symptomatic. And you'd get, eventually you might get symptoms. And then there are people that are truly asymptomatic, but like no, nothing, but that's pretty rare. Um, and what gives you symptoms is gonna be a lot of different things, right? Your own genetic and phenotypic history your vaccine status, your immune status, if you've been naturally exposed, the dose that you got. So dose, people think, a lot of people say, oh, I'll just go out and get a natural infection. I won't bother with the vaccine. I'm young, I can take it. Um, we don't know how, uh, um, how exposure translates into immunity when we can't control for dose. So the reason the vaccines work is they're controlling for the dose of the Im immunogenic stimulant that you're getting. When you get a natural exposure, you get a couple of virion particles, you might incubate the virus, it might take 11 days for it to build up enough to even cause a test to signal that you're positive. You could be transmitting at low levels the whole time. So dose is really important, like how much of a natural dose you get. And that will also impact whether you develop symptoms and how long you transmit. So, yeah, it's really complicated, right? And it, you can't control for all of those factors. But truly asymptomatic people are pretty rare. Mm -hmm. That said, as far as I know, I've not
not got COVID. So maybe I was asymptomatic. I've been pretty careful. So, all right, well, oh, there's a question oh. at the back. No, um, I, I do have a very problematic relationship with certain kinds of cayenne pepper, and that's probably the amoebic dysentery talking, but the pathogen itself is gone. So it's probably just um, a change in my general microbiome. Um, Plasmodium falciparum is a form of malaria. We get three, we, humans can get uh, three main species of malaria, and uh, falciparum is not the kind that recrudesces that hides out and comes back. So I'm lucky that way. Yeah. Yes? So in your talk, um, it sort of sounds like uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is going to be around for a while. Can you know, keep on mutating, doing new things, developing new tricks? Can you uh, yeah. suggest a scenario where in January of 2020, and it's not going away. <laughs> but there could be, in a few hundred years, a scenario. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where, where it becomes one of our common <coughs> cold <coughs> So but it, would take, it would take that much time. It would be like five years to develop into a common um, so it depends on, it, it really comes down to this, right? As a society, when when do we, and the, the virus doesn't care what, what we think, I'm mean, just gonna <laughs> keep going, right? But as a society, when do we stop, uh, when do we stop following a course of intervention uh, and, and do something different? So for example, there are very few, uh, you know, there are very few interventions out there for the common cold, right? And, and that's really because most people, uh, unless you have other kinds of conditions, like, you, have, you know, you have HIV, and you, you know, you don't mount an immune response or something, uh, it's not deadly under any scenario. So what people do in the field of epidemiology is what they, they, they kind of measure extra deaths. So, so in the peak of Omicron, and even the other peaks, there were people that were dying that didn't have to die, right? There were people, there were hospitals that were overwhelmed. There were no ventilators. There were people that were unvaccinated and could have been. So, so there were this, there's this thing called extra deaths, right? Um, it's the same with, you know, wearing seatbelts in cars and traffic deaths, right? So you, you ask yourself, how can we mitigate uh, a, a mortality rate, and then once we've done everything we can do to mitigate it, we live with it, right? So with the common cold, we can live with that mortality rate. We've done everything we can to mitigate it. Um, with the flu, there are still lots of people that die of flu, and there are lots of people that don't have access to Tamiflu, the antiviral, which isn't as good as Paxlovid, actually. So there's still room to develop better antivirals, and there's still room to develop a better flu vaccine. So we're still, we still freak out about flu, even though it doesn't make the news. There are still many, um, many opportunities for mitigation and intervention that as a society we're working on. We will probably continue to do that for SARS coronavirus too as well. Uh, it's going to be, I think, many decades before our society stops trying to figure out how to reduce the mortality rate of COVID-19, especially because long COVID is still a thing. I mean, it's still a thing, um, and that's just our country. Like, there are many countries uh, that are so under-vaccinated that uh, it's, it's, and there's still extra, many extra deaths. Like, the death rate is still high in many places. So this is, this is not going to go away as an opportunity for public health intervention and all that kind of thing for a while, <laughs> quite a while. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Well, I thought, I think that was very, very, very informative. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we really needed that, I think, with all that we 
we hear everywhere on the radio and on the TV and read online, we sometimes really need the scientists to come in who's on, on yeah. the cutting edge of the research. Yeah, there's an infodemic, no yes. question yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much.